And we're going to continue talking about um, rectifiers. So we, we went over the half wave rectifier in the last class. It just consists of a diode in series with the resistor, and you take the voltage across the resistor. Uh, we went over kind of the ideal model. This is what's happening at the output. So when the input is positive, the output follows the, it mirrors the input, and when the input goes negative, you reverse biasing the diode, so the output becomes zero, and then when the input becomes positive again, your output again mirrors your input voltage, in the ideal case. Uh, this is a little bit more realistic, so this is replacing the ideal diode with the constant voltage drop model for the diode. Okay, so right when this black line is is the voltage source okay so your voltage source has to uh, increase to a certain point before you actually start getting a voltage across the resistor so what value is this uh, this value on the y-axis 0 0.7 volts uh, assuming that our our constant voltage drop model is, is for a silicon diode. Okay, so um, my diode doesn't start fully conducting until I have 0.7 volts across it. So my source voltage has to increase to at least 0.7 volts. And at that point, my diode will be fully forward biased. It will start to conduct a current through it. And so I'll get a voltage across my resistor because now I have a current flowing through the resistor. Okay, so that's why this blue curve, which is plotting the voltage across um, the resistor in the schematic, doesn't start increasing until the point in time that my source voltage is at least 0.7 volts. And then at that point, you'll just track along uh, with the source voltage. But of course, there'll be uh, this gap between the peak voltage across your resistor and the peak voltage that your source is providing and so this gap uh, here is how many volts the difference between the, the maximum voltage at the source and the maximum voltage at the output is going to be what value? Zero point seven volts. Because whatever voltage I have on my source, the voltage across my my resistor is going to be uh, point seven volts less than that. Because your diode, when it's fully turned on, is going to have point seven volts drop across it. Okay, so this is also 0 0.7 volts. Okay, so that's what's happening with the half wave, half wave rectifier. But it's not uh, necessarily the best rectifier because when my source voltage is going negative, my output voltage is just becoming zero. Okay, so I'm not, the circuit is not really doing anything when my source voltage is negative. Okay, so we're not fully utilizing our source. If you wanted to do that, you can use a full wave rectifier. And there's a, there's a few ways to build a, a full wave rectifier. Um, we'll talk about two ways. Uh, one way 
is uh, something called a center tap uh, full wave rectifier. And it's called uh, center tap because here we're kind of combining the rectifier with the transformer part of the circuit. So here's your, your AC wall voltage. It goes through a transformer to step down that voltage. And then uh, the full wave rectifier is this part. So now we're rectifying the AC voltage. And it's called a center tap because what you're doing is you still have only one diode and a resistor, but this resistor, oh sorry, you have two dials, forgot about this one. Um, this resistor is connected to the middle of this coil here on your transformer. So the middle of the secondary winding of your transformer. And then, uh, and then yeah, then you have your second diode connected to the other side of the, of the, the transformer. So it's a center tap full wave rectifier. Okay, and we can understand what's going on here again just in terms of looking uh, in which way the diodes are biased. Okay, so what I've done uh, on these schematics down at, at the bottom here is I'm taking this center tap full wave rectifier and I'm just breaking it up into two uh, separate circuits. So these two circuits make up the full wave rectifier. Okay, so one circuit that just contains diode one and the resistor, and um, the source that's supplied to this circuit, that's this VS over here. Okay, and then the second part contains the diode D2, same load resistor R, um, and we're looking at this VS down here. Okay, so you can see that the negative side of this VS, the more negative side of this VS is uh, connected to the anode of D2. So that's why the negative side of this source is connected there. And the positive side of this VS goes to the same node as the ground terminal of um, the, the load resistor. Okay, so the positive side here goes to the ground terminal. Okay, so if we break up the circuit this way, it's a little bit easier to see what's happening um, to the diodes depending upon what's going on here with this AC line voltage. So this is this is VAC. Okay, so let's say that uh, we're in the part of the cycle where your your wall voltage is positive. Okay, so that corresponds to uh, this part of the, the full wave rectifier with diode D1, and this part of the full wave rectifier with diode D2. Okay, so what bias condition is uh, diode D1? Okay, so D1 is forward bias. And uh, what do you expect the output voltage to be? Uh, positive or, ne or negative or zero positive because it's forward bias so I'm conducting some current through diode D1 and I'll get uh, some voltage across R and the current is going in that direction so that according to our sign convention corresponds to a positive voltage across R okay so that's what's happening when my AC voltage is, is greater than zero Okay, what's happening to diode D2? So at the same time that diode D1 is forward bias, diode D2 is now reverse bias. Okay, so that means no current from diode D2, no current is, is going to flow through the resistor R. So, so none of the, the output voltage uh, V0 has any contribution from any current to diode D2. Okay, so diode D2 reverse bias. And this is all happening at the same time and we're only looking at the the time period when this AC voltage is positive. Okay, so now let's look at the part of the cycle where this AC line voltage becomes negative. Okay, so that means the AC voltage becomes negative, so I'm changing the polarity of the source in both cases. 
Okay, so now what happens to diode D1? So now diode D1 is reverse biased. So there's no current flowing through diode D1. So diode D1 is not contributing any current to any voltage across the output. But at the same time, what do we have for, for diode D2? So diode D2 now is forward biased. So I'm going to get some current to flow through diode D2. And again, that's going to correspond to a positive voltage at the output, according to our sign conventions here. So diode D2 becomes forward bias, and I get a positive output voltage. So if I put all of that together, when my AC voltage was positive, I had a positive voltage at the output because I started conducting current through diode D1. When my AC voltage is negative, I'm only conducting current through diode D2, but my output voltage is again positive. Okay, so if I'm going to look at the, the output of the full wave rectifier, that's this blue curve, and I look at the, the input voltage um, from the source, that's the black curve. So when my source voltage is positive, I have a positive voltage on the output due to this is due to the current through diode D1. Then when the supply voltage goes negative, I still have a positive voltage across the output. But this is due to the current through diode D2. And then that just repeats. Okay, this is the what the output's gonna look like if we if we take the constant voltage drop model. So what's the difference between uh, the start the peak of the source voltage and the peak of the output voltage? 0 0.7 volts because at any given point in time I'm conducting current through one of the diodes at once. Okay, so I, I, that diode is dropping 0.7 volts across it. Okay, so this is how the, the center tap full wave rectifier works. Any questions on, on how this is working? Okay, if not, I'm going to talk about a different type of full wave rectifier. This one is called uh, the bridge rectifier. So again, I'm showing it at the output of a, a, of a transformer. But now I don't have to uh, find the center of the transformer. I'm just going to make this circuit um, across the output of the secondary winding of the transformer. Okay, now it uses uh, four diodes. And my load resistor is in the middle here um, between that diode network. Okay, so what's happening here? So when my AC voltage is greater than zero, okay, so that corresponds to this VS being greater than zero, which diodes are going to be forward biased? Uh, D1. Okay, so D1 is forward biased, so I have some current going to D1. That's a, that's a, a good uh, assumption because um, the uh, anode side of D1 is at a positive potential. Okay, so I have current going through here. Current 
won't want to go through D3, so the current's going to go through the, the load resistor this way, and uh, also go through D2. There's ground here, but, but D2 should be at a lower potential, because it's, it's negative. Okay, so in this case, uh, diodes D1 and D2 are forward biased. And diode D3 and D4, they're facing the wrong direction uh, for this current path. So those are reversed bias. Okay, so if I get for, for the voltage at the input greater than zero, this is my current path. Comes through diode D1, flows through my load resistor, so I generate um, an output voltage, as shown here. This is the positive side. Then it comes out through dial D2. Okay, how about now uh, when this AC voltage is less than zero? Okay, so now that means Vs is less than zero, and if I say Vs is less than zero, that just means I can switch these signs. Okay, so Vs is like that. Okay, now how does my current flow? Okay, so now diode D3, it's a good assumption that, that diode D3 is forward bias. Um, and dial D2 would be reverse bias. Dial D1, that's in the opposite, point in the opposite to where my current is gonna flow. So my current flows through the resistor again. But notice it's flowing through the resistor in the same direction that it was flowing um, in, in our previous case, when the AC voltage was greater than zero. Okay, so that means my voltage across this resistor is still gonna have the same polarity. Then the current is going to flow through diode D4. Okay, so now diode D3 and D4 are forward biased, and D1 and D2 are reverse biased. That's how this full wave rectifier works. Okay, so at any given point in time, two of the diodes are forward biased, and the other two reverse bias. So what does that mean for our output? Now what's the difference between the source voltage and the voltage that I'm measuring across the load resistor? So this is 1.4 now. Because at any given point in time, I have two dials of conducting current. So I need to take that um, 0.7 volt drop and multiply it by two. So two diodes and a 0.7 volts drop per diode. So that's how I get that, that 1.4. Okay, so now my output voltage is 1.4 volts less than what my input voltage was. Okay, so why would you want to make a, a bridge rectifier versus that, that center tap full wave rectifier? No, I still need the transformer. The transformer is here. Um, those are all good guesses, um, but they, they don't really matter too much. Because uh, to make a transformer like this versus the, the previous transformer, it's about the same. Um, I don't really care if I'm getting the full VS or not because I just put less windings in my transformer. Um, so I don't step down the voltage that much. If you didn't need to step down the voltage, you wouldn't need a transformer, but that would apply to, to both types of rectifiers. Uh, the first one, 
let's see. So if I didn't uh, have the coil, as long as I could divide this, find the the, the um, mean of, of the, the AC voltage across here. Let's think uh, more practically and less, less theoretical. So these transformers are going to have a lot of... Have you ever taken a look at, at a transformer? Um, you can probably look up images of them online. But they have a lot of windings to them. Okay, So the, the, the length of the, the wire that's wound around is, is quite long. And in order for this full wave rectifier to um, be fully balanced, meaning that um, the voltage at this peak is exactly the same as the voltage on this peak when the voltage goes negative, you need to find the exact center of that coil. Okay, so that may or may not, I mean, that's not too much of a consideration, but if you want uh, a, a very precise uh, rectifier, then any small error in, in finding that exact center uh, of this coil is going to lead to some variation in the output voltage. So that's one consideration on why you, why you would not want to make uh, this type of, of full wave rectifier and you'd rather have the bridge rectifier. Can we think of reasons why we'd rather have this rectifier versus the bridge rectifier? Uh, yeah, so now, now I'm trying to think of, so I gave you a reason why you don't want this one. Less dials. So why, why do I want less dials? Cheaper. Uh, cheaper is, is one reason. So I got rid of half of my dials. So I'm spending 50% uh, less on, on whatever those dials cost. Uh, less voltage is lost between my source voltage and my output voltage, it's only 0.7 volts in this case. In this case, because I'm in the bridge rectifier case, I'm going to two diodes. So it's, it's 1.4 volts. That may or may not make a, a big deal. It depends on what these voltages actually are. Okay, so those are, those are, are, are some considerations in, in uh, selecting these, these rectifiers. Uh, there is another consideration, and that has to do with the specifications uh, of the diodes uh, in particular. Okay, so there are some important things to think about when you're when you think when you're selecting uh, diodes for these rectifiers. One of them is is the current handling capability. So if we look at the current through the diode and the voltage across the diode, we have that exponential curve. So we just say, you know, it, looks, it looks like this. And somewhere around here is 0.7 volts. Okay, but this is, this is not going to continue indefinitely. If you run enough current through your diode, you're going to burn out your diode. Okay, so this, does not, this current does not extend to infinity, even though it, it theoretically does. But, but each diode is going to have a, a rating of what's the maximum current that it can handle safely so that it doesn't burn out. Okay, so that's one consideration that you have to make uh, when you pick a diode. And generally, the more current you want, the bigger your diode has to be. Um, another uh, specification that you need to consider when you make uh, these diode circuits is something uh, called the peak inverse voltage or PIV. That's so continuing this diode curve to the negative side. Okay, when we reverse bias it, we say we have no current through it. But remember, at some point, we had the current again rapidly increasing. And this was a breakdown. Okay, so if you're using the diode as a rectifier, you don't want to enter breakdown because that means you lose that, um, that switching that you were doing before where you are making the 
the diode have zero current through it when you had reverse bias and then have current through it under forward bias. If our diodes could go into breakdown, we're going to lose rectification. Okay, so if you're using a diode in a rectifier, you never want the reverse bias voltage to get large enough so that you're going to break down. And that's what the pink inverse voltage is telling you. It's telling you what's the maximum reverse bias voltage you can put across that diode to make sure that it doesn't have to break down. Okay, so that's another specification um, that you can look up for diodes. Okay, and that means that uh, depending upon, also depending upon our rectifier configuration, we have different uh, values of this peak inverse voltage. So let's go back and let's look at this. Let's look at the half wave rectifier. Okay, so uh, once my uh, voltage becomes negative, what's the what's the peak reverse bias voltage that this diode is seeing? What's the, in other words, what's that peak inverse voltage for the half wave rectifier? Yeah, minus Vs. Because once the diode goes into reverse bias, I don't have any voltage uh, dropped across uh, this resistor, but I'm sustaining that voltage drop across the diode. Okay, so that's for the, the half wave rectifier. Now for this full wave rectifier, what's the peak inverse voltage across diode, let's say diode D2 in this case? Uh, so Vs is here and Vs is here. Vs is not across the whole thing. So this is again negative Vs because uh, let's look at this circuit. So so when uh, I have Vs negative, that full voltage is, is dropping across diode D2. Okay, so that's my peak inverse voltage for the flow wave rectifier. Now, how about bridge rectifier? So let me maybe draw it. So let's say Vs is a uh, negative this way. And I'm just going to draw uh, now the reverse bias path. OK, so my reverse bias is across diode D1 and D2. So what's the, the peak inverse voltage that one of these diodes experiences? Yeah, half, half of Vs, because there's two diodes there now. Okay, so the peak inverse voltage for this was Let's just do it in magnitude. Vs, Vs, and that's a half Vs. Okay, so I can use diodes in the bridge rectifier that don't have a, as high an, an inverse voltage rating. That is another possible advantage uh, of using the bridge rectifier. Any questions on uh, these rectifiers that we talked about? Okay.
now let's uh, add some more functionality to our rectifiers. So, what we did so far with these full wave rectifiers and the half wave rectifiers, we took our, our AC wall voltage, we used the transformer to step it down, went through the rectifier, and now instead of having this voltage that goes from positive values to negative values, it's all positive values, but it goes from zero to Vs minus whatever your, your diode voltage drops are, back down to zero, and that repeats. Okay, so this is not DC yet. You can't run your DC electronics off of this. They're going to be turning off at, at a frequency of about 60 hertz, and they're, they're not going to like it. Okay, so we need to, in order to actually make a AC to DC uh, converter, we need to do more than that. Okay, so we still have this case. We, we've done rectification now, but the variation in the voltage at the output of the rectifier is still about equal to the peak voltage um, from our source. So it's too much. So we need to reduce this variation. And we can do that uh, by adding this one component uh, to our rectifier. And that's just putting in a capacitor. Okay, so the capacitor is now going to have a, a finite uh, charging time and a finite discharge time that you went over a lot in 211 and 213. And so if you choose the, your value of the capacitor so that your, uh, your time constant is much larger than the, the periods that you have for whatever signals you're applying to here, it's going to take a long time um, for it to discharge and it'll smooth out uh, the, the voltages um, that are across the, the load resistor. Okay, so uh, here's the, the um, equations um, to figure all that stuff out. Uh, the load current is the output current divided that by that resistance. The diode current by KCL is now going to be equal to that load current plus the current through the capacitor and then the current through the capacitor is going to be C dV dt and that V is going to be approximately equal to um, the voltage of your input. Okay so this is what's going to happen now um, to your output. Uh, you will have a, your, your positive voltage at the source. Um, this is not the, the very first uh, um, voltage pulse from the source. So we're assuming that this uh, rectifier has been running for a long time. Okay, so you're going to charge up your capacitor in this interval here from T1 to T2. And that's called the conduction interval. Um, and then once you get to the peak voltage of your source, once that starts decreasing, right, the voltage at your output is going to want to start decreasing as well. But now you're going to uh, start using some of that stored energy from the capacitor that's going to discharge um, through your resistor. And so that's going to smooth out uh, that drop. So your voltage at the output is not going to drop as quickly as the voltage is at the input. And then you want to make that so it's a very slow decay. So by the time uh, your output voltage drops a significant amount, you're back on the, the positive cycle at the input, and it's going to charge up your capacitor again. OK, so for, in order for this to happen, you need to choose um, your RC time constant so it's much, much greater uh, than the, the period of your signal T. Now, even if you uh, choose that, then you're still going to have some amount of ripple. And so what that is is a difference between the, the peak voltage and um, the lowest voltage that you see at the output. Okay, so we can characterize that by looking at um, the voltage at the end of the discharge interval. So that's just going to be the voltage, the peak voltage, minus the amount of the ripple 
And that's going to be approximately related to, or approximated as the peak voltage minus um, the exponential of the, uh, the period divided by the time constant. Okay, but we already said that the, the time constant is going to be much, much greater than the period. So we can make another approximation and then just solve for uh, what that ripple voltage will be. So using this equation, we can choose or we can uh, set a value of our capacitor given some load resistance and the frequency that we're working at in order to achieve a certain ripple voltage. And this, is, this equation, since we made these approximations, it's only valid if the ripple voltage is much, much smaller than your peak voltage, but that's the case that you want anyway. You don't want to, if you're, if you're putting this capacitor there to try to smooth out your signal, you don't want a large ripple anyway. Um, and then this equation down here is for your conduction interval. That gives you uh, how much time it takes for the capacitor to charge up uh, once you get to the, the end of the discharge cycle and the start of the charging cycle. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, let's go back to go back to this slide. Okay, so we did the transformer, we did the diode rectifier. Uh, by this filter, um, this is the peak rectifier. Okay, so we progressed through all of this so far. We went from our AC voltage to our unipolar output. Then we add a capacitor and we can smooth out um, the output of the rectifier. But we're still going to have some, some ripple there. So if you want to make the voltage at the output even smoother and even more DC-like, uh, it's a good idea to put a voltage regulator there. And then you can connect up your load. Okay, so we're going to look at a way to create this voltage regulator using only diodes. Uh, but before we do that, let's go back to our diode IV curve. Okay, so we talked about operation and forward bias. We talked about operation and reverse bias. And so far we said breakdown is bad. We don't, we don't want to go into breakdown. Um, but there are diodes that are specifically designed so that you can work with them in breakdown. They're made to operate in breakdown. Okay, so these diodes are called uh, Zener diodes um, or breakdown diodes. And this is their circuit symbol. It looks like the, the regular diode symbol, except there's these two tails that are added to, to this part of the arrow. Uh, maybe if you kind of squint, that sort of looks like a, a, a sideways Z. But anyway, that's that's the circuit symbol. And these are made to operate in breakdown. Okay, so let's take a closer look at breakdown. So now we're, we're zooming in on, on the breakdown uh, part of the curve. Um, so there are some um, important voltages here. Uh, this negative VZK, this is the Zener knee voltage. That's what the K is for. Um, and that's the voltage at which your, your breakdown current starts increasing uh, very rapidly. And the current that corresponds to this negative VZK voltage is negative IZK, or the Zener knee current. Then once you increase beyond that voltage, if you increase the reverse bias voltage a little bit more, you start entering this part of breakdown, which is almost linear. Okay, so this is different from the 
the um, forward bias case where that was an exponential curve. This part of the curve is, is almost linear. And so we can approximate it with a slope of negative 1 over RZ, where RZ is the, uh, the incremental resistance uh, of your, your Zener diode. And that's usually a pretty low resistance, so uh, less than 10 ohms or so. Uh, depends on the diode. And we can operate this diode at some point, so that would correspond to this uh, reverse bias voltage across it, negative Vz, and then if I see where that intersects, the breakdown curve, and then that would correspond to some current, negative Iz. Okay, so how does this help us? Um, oh, one, one more uh, value I forgot to tell you is this negative Vz0. So this is the value, if you took the, the linear approximation for this curve and just extend it so you find the, uh, the uh, intercept at, at y equals 0, then that's going to be negative Vz0. And that value is going to be very close to whatever the Zener knee value uh, Zener knee value is. So a lot of times we just use this Vz0 value. Okay. Now, if we use this, this linear approximation for this curve, we can generate an equation to tell us what the reverse bias voltage will be. Uh, so negative, so Vz is going to be equal to Vz0 plus uh, Rz times the, the current through the diode in breakdown, which is Iz. Okay, and if we are operating at a current that is significantly greater or, or greater than that Zener knee current uh, and my voltage across the diode is greater than Vz0, then I can approximate my uh, reverse bias Zener diode in breakdown by just a DC source with a value of Vz0 and a resistor with a value of Rz. Okay, so this replaces so here's my reverse biased uh, Zener diode and this equivalent circuit will replace that. Now the important thing to note here is that uh, well, first of all, this is a nice linear slope, but also the, the slope is really steep because the value of my uh, resistance Rz is very small. So I can have a, a pretty big change in current, and I won't have a very big change in voltage across my senior diode. And that's what we want uh, to make a voltage regulator. Okay, so an application uh, for these Zener diodes um, is for voltage regulation. And let's look at an example of that. Okay, so this is how you would hook a Zener diode up um, so that you could make a voltage regulator. Here's your, your positive supply voltage, and let's say it has some ripple on it of about plus or minus one volt. So we, we had some signal, we rectified it, we put it through a peak rectifier, but it still has a, a voltage ripple. Of a, of a volt, okay, and so we want to regulate that further so we get even less of a ripple at my output of my load resistance RL. Okay, so I'm just going to put some resistor here, um, and I'll put a load resistor in parallel with a Zener diode. It's reverse bias, but it's also going to be bias um, so that it's in breakdown. Okay. And my Zener diode is going to have these specifications. So if I use the, a real Zener diode, I'm just looking up the data sheet uh, for that diode. Um, if I have a voltage across that Zener diode of 6.8 volts, a reverse bias of 6.8 volts, then the current through this diode is going to be 5 milliamps. The uh, incremental resistance is 20 ohms, and the current at the Zener knee is going to be 0.2 milliamps. Okay, so let's look at 
the characteristics of this diode. And for a voltage regulator, what you want to look at is how much change are you going to get at the output um, divided by the change in the voltage you're going to get from your source. Uh, that's called the line regulation. And you also know how much want to know how much change in output voltage you're going to get uh, normalized to the change in your load current. And that's called the load regulation. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna answer these questions. So the first thing to do uh, in order to answer those questions is we're gonna replace that Zener diode um, by that equivalent circuit model of just that that DC source with a value VZ naught and a resistance that's equal to the incremental resistance of the diode. Okay, so I know what this is. This is given. This is 20 ohms. Uh, but I don't know what this value is, VZ naught. I'm given a VZ at a certain uh, Zener current, but I'm not given what VZ naught is. Okay, so let's calculate what that is. Okay, so in order to calculate this, uh, we're going to use Remember, this is one of the equations um, that go along with this equivalent circuit model. So we can plug in values that we know in order to find out what VZ0 is. Okay, and we know if the voltage across our R0 diode is 6.8 volts, then the current through that diode is 5 milliamps. So I'm going to plug that in for VZ and IZ. Okay, so 6.8 volts. IZ is 5 milliamps, and I know that the incremental resistance is 20 ohms. So I can then calculate what VZ naught is. And if you plug in all these values, it comes out to 6.7 volts. Okay, so I know now that that voltage is 6.7 volts. Okay, now the next things I want to do is I want to find out uh, what is the, the current through my uh, Zener diode. And I'll assume that no load is connected yet. So, so that's not connected there yet. OK, so let's uh, figure out what that value is. So the current through my Zener diode IZ is going to be equal to this current through the resistor I, because I'm not connecting the load yet. And what's that going to be? What's the equation for that? <laughs> okay, when you had the diode there, this was a 323 problem. But now the diode is replaced by the equivalent circuit. You just have DC sources and resistors. This is now a 211 problem. What's the current? I know you learned this in EE211, at least half of the class did. What's Ohm's law? V equals IR, and I want to know current. So it's V over R. So it's the total voltage drop through here divided by the total resistance. What's the total voltage drop? V plus. The, the total voltage drop across only the resistors is not V plus. V plus minus VZ naught. And the total resistance is R plus RZ. 
Okay, so here's your equation. If you don't understand this equation, uh, you have a lot of studying to do before the first exam. Okay, so 10 volts minus VZ naught, we solved for that already, 6.7 volts, uh, divided by R. I think I wrote, yeah, I wrote R before, but I didn't write it here. Okay, so this is half a kilo ohm, and this is given as 20 ohms. Okay, so IZ is 6.35 milliamps without having the load connected. Okay, now let's also find what V0 is with no load. So how do I figure out what V0 is? What's my equation going to be for V0? V0 naught plus I times RZ. Yes. Okay, so that's written here. Okay, so 6.7 volts is VZ naught. We just solve for IZ or I by 20 ohms. Okay, so my output voltage is 6.83 volts with no load connected. Okay, now I'm going to figure out original questions. Okay, so line regulation. Um, what happens to uh, the output voltage if V plus changes by plus or minus one volt? Okay, so I can figure that out. But the change in the output voltage is just going to be the change in this V plus uh, and I do a, a voltage divider between RZ and R. Okay, so that's going to be that plus or minus 1 volt. RZ is 20 ohms, and R was a half a kilo ohm. So the change in the output voltage is going to be about 40 millivolts from 1 volt. So line regulation delta V0 over delta V plus is about 40 millivolts. Uh, per volt. So I'm, I'm doing a better job um, already. My, my voltage at the output is only going to vary by about 40 millivolts now instead of 1 volt. Uh, if we want to do the load regulation, so let's just assume that the, the load current is a milliamp. So that means uh, I calculated what, what I and IZ was which was uh, 6 point something milliamps. And now I'm saying that this is 1 milliamp. So my current through my Zener diode is now going to be a milliamp less than what it used to be. And that's going to then affect um, the voltage because that means I'm dropping less voltage across that resistor, RZ. And I can figure out what that is by just taking the delta. Okay, so that comes out to uh, 20 millivolts. And so my load regulation, which is the change in the output voltage divided by the change in the load voltage is going to be negative 20 volts, millivolts per milliamp. Okay, so that's pretty good too. And then the, the last question is, now what happens if I change my load resistance to a half a kilo ohm now? It, my my uh, load resistance before, actually I was neglecting it, but now if I make the load resistance half a kilo ohm, what's going to happen to the circuit? Uh, I guess we don't have time to go through this. So I'll, I'll, we'll look at this again uh, on Monday. I think your homework is due on Monday too. Thank you.